Hello, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our alumni webinar series. Uh, my name is Dr. Rob O'Connor. I'm a senior lecturer in creative writing and creative industries here at YSJU in the School of Humanities. Um, I teach creative writing and publishing, and my research interests also include genre studies, science fiction, fantasy, um, publishing, uh, and also uh, the representation of monsters in literature. Uh, which is a bit of a weird one, but uh, I'm like that. Anyway, enough of me. I've been asked here today to host this webinar as part of the YSJU alumni series entitled Alumni Journeys, Creativity, Careers and Community. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, there are a few housekeeping matters. We will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the talk. The questions have been prepared in advance, but if you do have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, please email alumni at yorksj.ac.uk and the team there will pass on any questions that you have. There's also an auto transcript um, appearing during the talk for increased accessibility. However, please be aware it may not be translating perfectly. Okay, thank you. That's uh, all we need to talk about for housekeeping. It's now my real great pleasure uh, to introduce today's guest, Ellen Taylor. Ellen studied psychology at York St. John, graduating in 2017. While at YSJ, she chaired the Creative Writing Society for two years. She then studied an MSc in Cognitive Neuroscience at Durham University and a DPhil at University of Oxford. In 2022, she published her first novella entitled Said the Crow. It's an amazing piece of work. Please go and check it out after this webinar. Her short story, Stella Polaris, was runner-up of the Oxford BNU Prize in Creative Writing and will be published in 2023. The Tears of Leah, her first novel for young adults, will be released in 2024. Ellen is also an open water swimmer and has completed swims in the English Channel and the Corrivrecken Whirlpool. In 2019, Ellen and her, and her mother swam the strongest tidal current in the world situated in the Arctic Circle in Norway. Um, Ellen has written for Outdoor Swimming, amongst other publications. Um, so we, I'll be having a bit of a chat after Ellen's presentation, but it's now my pleasure to hand over to Ellen, uh, who's going to talk a bit more. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I'm just going to share a little um, PowerPoint that I've got. So hopefully this is coming up OK. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm essentially going to talk through everything that Rob's just said in a little bit more detail. So starting off with um, coming to York St. John, I applied to York St. John because I really loved York. Um, I'm from Norfolk, so quite a way away, but I'd been to York um, on school trips and little weekends away and I love the city. So um, it was that's why it was kind of top of my list of places to go to university. Um, and I came here in 2014. Um, so a few pictures from my first year. Um, in my first year, I got really involved in the students union. So I was on a psychology degree and I was program rep for my course. I stood in elections to be the faculty chair um, and that's where I kind of got really involved in the community and started um, loving university life really. I also worked at the Grand Hotel which is near the station so in my um, first and second year I was working there and in my third year I also worked in a pub called the Oxibition, Exhibition which is um, quite near the campus um, and yeah I just had a great three years kind of loving the city um, going out drinking lots going to all the lovely tea houses and cafes um, in my first year I did cheerleading so I was in the York St John uh, Cats um, I wasn't very good at it at all I'd done a bit of dancing beforehand but I've never been very good at dancing but it was um, great fun and a really good place to make some friends and at the end of my first year, as Rob said, I um, founded and chaired the Creative Writing Society. So um, here's a kind of picture of our team. So we've got Rachel, Jess and Jonathan, who were um, the others on the committee. Um, and it was brilliant fun. So we we kind of had weekly meetings where we'd alternate between working in a cafe, so just kind of having tea and cake and writing and um, having kind of discussions and debates and um, mini seminars on creative writing. Um, and we also had trips. So I think we went to Scarborough and we went to Knaresborough to see um, Mother Shipton's cave. So it's really great fun. Um, 
And when I when I applied to university, I was really torn between doing a psychology degree and an English degree with creative writing. So it was excellent to kind of have that um, aspect of creative writing still throughout my psychology degree. Um, in third year, I had my dissertation. So um, third year was a year of stress with lots of pizza and lying around feeling very stressed. Um, <laughs> and my dissertation was looking at paired associate learning and arithmetic. So this was supervised by Dr. Lorna Hamilton, who I think now is Professor Lorma Lorna Hamilton. Um, and my real interest was reading development and language processing, which is what Lorna works on quite a lot. Um, so I think that kind of came from the interest I've always had in writing and reading. Um, and I really loved developmental psychology. So asking questions like, um, how do children learn to read? Why are there individual differences in reading? Um, what happens in the brain when we're processing language? And the arithmetic study that I was working on was kind of um, looking at the other side of that, so numeracy development, which wasn't completely my interest, um, but was kind of adjacent to the, the reading development stuff. So I really loved working on that project project. Um, I got to present at the undergraduate research conference, and I also um, did a research, a kind of student research job with Lorna. So that was um, great. And after that, I um, had the opportunity to do a master's. So I went to Durham. Um, I'd really loved being in the Northeast and I wanted to go a little bit further north. So um, I went to Durham with the hopes that I'd be kind of living in this Harry Potter universe. Um, and I studied cognitive neuroscience. Um, it was a really tough degree, I think, in hindsight. Um, I probably picked it for the wrong reasons. I thought it was really impressive and um, sounded really cool. It's really hard and I'm not that good at um, kind of biology and physics, which I think I needed more knowledge of. So I got through the year, um, but I think this picture really sums up how I was feeling at the end of it. Um, so I was glad to be done. Having said that, I um, had a great time at Durham um, making a, amazing friends. So I was involved in the middle common room, which is a little bit similar to the students union, but at the college level, um, because there are different colleges at Durham. Um, and I was welfare officer there. So um, again, that's kind of tying in with my love for psychology and taking on more of that kind of pastoral role within the college community. And um, at the end of my year um, at Durham was when I kind of really took the, the swimming to the next step. So um, as Rob mentioned, I've kind of done lots of swimming um, and I haven't talked about that so far, but I've always kind of loved outdoor swimming. And when I was at York St. John, I started um, taking part in winter swimming competitions. So swimming outdoors in winter. And my mum has always been a big swimmer. So um, we would go on lots of kind of adventures together. But the Corrie Vrecken Whirlpool was the first swim that I did on my own. Um, not completely on my own. I was with another group of swimmers and um, I had a boat next to me the whole time. But it was the first kind of one that I signed up for without my mum, without any friends and travelled up to Scotland to swim across it. So the Whirlpool itself is between um, Jura and Scarborough, which are these two islands um, just kind of off the west coast. And um, you can see here actually between these islands here, that's where the Whirlpool is. So um, it's the third strongest Whirlpool in the world. Um, and because it's tidal, it only appears kind of at certain times in, in the tides. So there are times where the sea is relatively flat and you can swim between the islands, um, obviously with a boat and someone watching out for you. Um, so that was really where I started to get quite obsessed with swimming and um, I wanted to kind of start taking it to the next level. So after this great summer of, um, of being relieved that my cognitive neuroscience master's was over and having lots of fun swimming with my friends in Durham. I applied, um, or I had applied previously, and I, I was accepted to study a DPhil, which is essentially the same thing as a PhD um, at Oxford in experimental psychology. So um, yeah, I, I loved Oxford. I had all of these dreams of, um, 
of going there for the lovely architecture and writing and working really hard and being a serious academic. Um, but when I got there, I realized that I just wanted to swim. <laughs> so um, I was living in Jericho, which is in the north of Oxford. And there's a common nearby called Port Meadow where the River Thames flows through it. And it's a really great place for open water swimming. There's a whole community there. Um, who go regularly and I decided to set myself the challenge to swim every single day for a whole year and I completed that so this picture here is um, me in Scotland actually on a kind of weekend swimming um, on my 365th day of swimming outdoors um, so that was an excellent kind of um, time of my life I think probably the happiest I've ever been I love being outdoors love being in nature um I think my DPhil supervisor was probably a little bit annoyed that I wasn't doing that much work um but it was a brilliant time and um swimming for a whole year also meant swimming through the winter so um as I mentioned I'd done a bit of winter swimming before but it was um really taking it to the next level going every day throughout the year whether whether it's um snow or shine um, and, and getting involved in some of these winter swimming competitions as well. And I also um, had the opportunity to start writing about my swimming. So I was keeping a swimming blog. So um, when I swam the Corrie Wreck and Whirlpool, I wrote a blog post about that. And I started during this year writing for other publications as well. So like the Outdoor Swimmer magazine here. And um, at the end of this year, we decided to swim across the Salt Straumann. So um, I mentioned the Corrie Vrecken Whirlpool earlier and that this is the third strongest whirlpool in the world. And I thought if this is the third strongest, what's the first? And it's the Salt Straumann, which is a tidal cor current up in the Arctic Circle in Norway. So the water is quite cold. Um, and I really, really wanted to do it. It's... Um, before we attempted this swim, it had only been successfully swum um, by three people, all of whom are brothers, um, and they swam it a few years before us. And I decided I wanted to go up there with my mum and become the first women to swim across the Salt Straumann. So um, we did. So I've got a little video here just to kind of show what it's like Um at full tide this is not what it looked like when we swam across if we'd have got in the water here we would have definitely not made it out again um so it was very flat when we swam across but it is a really exciting place to be um as you can see here from this video um so we swam across the salt Straumann, um and that was really the kind of pinnacle of this year of swimming um and while i was swimming and um supposedly working on my DPhil, I was getting really kind of obsessed with um, Norway, with kind of the pull of the north, all these Arctic places and anything related to the sea. So um, ships, old maps, anything like that, I was getting really into. And um, at the same time, I was writing my novel, The Tears of Lear. So this is um, a young adult fantasy novel. It's about a girl who um, kind of meets these pirates in the middle of the night and is taken on this epic adventure um, around Scotland and Norway and um, all of these incredible places with lots of kind of fantasy elements as well. So I wrote Tears of Lear um, while I was doing this swimming and while I was very much in the mindset of, of in love with open water and the sea. And I submitted this to an agent at the... Um, end of the year so just after I completed my year of swimming and um and he really loved it so I signed a contract with him he sent it out to loads of publishers um and for a couple of years we went back and forth with various publishers unfortunately no one loved it quite enough to publish it um this was also around the time of covid so I think it was quite difficult to um take a bet on a new, new author at that time um but it was a brilliant experience and it gave me loads of confidence in my writing. So um, then kind of lockdown hit amongst all of this um, publishing and while I was doing my DPhil and um, during the kind of isolation and paranoia that was happening around um, the first 
COVID lockdown, I started writing my novel, um, my novella, Said the Crow. So this um, isn't set in lockdown, but it follows a couple who move up to the Scottish Highlands um, um, and it kind of follows their relationship as it um, almost falls apart. Um, and it's it's very kind of much drawing on the idea of paranoia and isolation and all of those feelings that I think were very much present during that time. Um, so I finished writing this um, earlier um, this year in 2022, and I decided to self-publish it. So I think um, I've been trying to get things traditionally published for many years, and I just got to the point where I really wanted someone to read my work. So I decided to try um, self-publishing with this, and it was a really good process. It's been very difficult trying to um, widen my audience, and I think um, there's definitely something to be said for having um, the money of a traditional publisher behind you. Um, but it's been really good and I, I love every time someone reads my work. Um, so this is my novella that's out. And um, also while I was at Oxford, I entered a short story competition, which was the Oxford BNU Award in Creative Writing that was open to anyone at the University of Oxford and the Beijing New University. And I was awarded runner up for this short story. So this is Stella Polaris. It's coming out um, next year and it's set on the island of Dura. So you can see in the cover um, my picture there of the Cory Vrecken Whirlpool um, or the, the kind of um, current that, that runs between the two islands. And this is a kind of nostalgic um, short story about a woman who grew up in Dura and is trying to kind of um, face the ghosts of her childhood. So that's coming out next year um, and again is another way for me to tie together my um, my love for swimming and, um, and my love for writing. So um, I haven't really talked much about my DPhil because I've been sidetracked by all the other exciting things that I think I was a little bit more interested in at the time, um, but I have now handed in my thesis. So my DPhil was um, tracking contextual histories, how long-term and recent lexical experience shapes our processing of words. So I mentioned earlier that I'm really interested in um, in reading development and language processing. So how we read, how that's kind of processed in the brain. Um, and I got to do this. So my supervisor was Professor Kate Nation um, and I handed in my thesis about a month ago, got my Viva coming up soon. So it's kind of ending this chapter of my life. Um, and at the end of, of my um, thesis, I kind of realised that I love academia, I love working in a university environment, um, but perhaps research isn't quite for me, um, or at least I'm ready for a break from research. So I um, got a position at the University of Nottingham, where I work now, and it's a teaching associate role. So um, there's a little bit of research in terms of um, supervising dissertations and things like that but it's mostly teaching which I think is um, where my heart is really at so I'm really happy now to have this role um, and yeah so that that's it basically just a kind of um, summary of where I'm at now in my life I'm living near Nottingham um, with my lovely cat called Honey so it's beautiful to to have um, have such a lovely cat with me um, and also living with my husband so we got married in the summer I also um, attempted to swim the English Channel this summer um, didn't quite make it all the way to France. Um, I had to be pulled out because the conditions were getting worse and worse and I was being quite slow. Um, but that was a brilliant swim. So I'm definitely still very much in the swimming scene and looking forward to more swimming adventures. And other than that, I'm just writing lots and reading lots and um, enjoying life. So yeah, that's, um, that's my kind of um, summary talk. Thank you, Alan. That was really insightful and lots of um, things to consider about your journey so far and the activity that 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 you've been you've been up to since your time at YSJ. Um, so I've got a few questions to to ask you, um, and obviously we're thinking about perhaps some of the students who might be watching this webinar. So there's kind of a creative writing and publishing focus to start with, maybe. 
Um, so the first question I wanted to ask is, um, could you tell us a bit more about your experience with traditional publishing? You mentioned you had tried to get things published traditionally, and um, I just wondered what that was like and whether you had any advice for maybe creative writing students or people who, or authors who want to go down the traditional route. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's definitely a good route to think about. Um, and I would definitely recommend anyone who wants to be published to, to give that a good go before self-publishing, um, if, if they want to, um, just because there are so many benefits that come with it. But it is also very difficult. A lot of it is based in luck. So definitely don't be disheartened if, if it doesn't work out. Um, but to kind of talk through the practicalities of the process, um, the first thing you want to have is a piece of work that's complete. So um, so if you're writing a novel, have a novel that's finished. Um, make sure you edit through it and make sure it's absolutely perfect um, or as perfect as you can possibly get it. And then you want to approach a literary agent. So writing them a letter that's kind of giving a short summary of your book, trying to pitch it, really trying to sell it. So in a, in a couple of lines, why it's really good and why they should read it. And also some details of why you think that they're the best literary agent for you. So um, you can find out information online of what types of books they represent and what books they um, really like. Um, so using that information, giving them a cover letter, you usually send off um, the first kind of three chapters or so of your work and a synopsis that gives a kind of summary, but all of that information will be on their um, agency websites. So that's probably the best thing to do. Um, and once you've got a literary agent, which is in itself a very difficult thing, they can then approach publishers um, and kind of pitch your work and sell it for you. So you don't have to necessarily go straight to the publisher. Um, and that's kind of as far as I've got with the process. I think that then once a publisher picks it up, it's um, a dream come true and they put a load of money behind your book and it's all fabulous, <laughs> but I can't speak to that myself. <laughs> no, no, that's great. So uh, what's really interesting is um, how you decided to go about publishing Seth the Crow and going down that self-publishing route. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a great novella. I really enjoyed it. And it's very twisty. It's it's the kind of fluidity of time in it is really interesting. So there's some fantastic things happening within the novella. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the novella, though. I mean, you said you read it during lockdown. And for me, it was quite interesting to see that influence sneaking sneaking into the narrative. But I wonder if you could just provide a little, little more insight into, into the novella, maybe give us a little bit of plot detail and the kind of inspiration behind it, but maybe how you, how it kind of developed as a project. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the story itself follows Rosie and Mark, who are a young couple, and they move um, out to kind of very isolated part of the countryside um, after something has happened. So there are hints of what has happened. Um, it seems that there's been some kind of event or um, potentially a breakdown of some kind, um, but it's not explicitly stated. Um, and it follows them as they move to this cottage, which is quite isolated, um, and just try to kind of make their lives work amongst this isolation. But um, it's told from Rosie's perspective and she has this very idyllic um, idea of, of what living out in the countryside will be like um, and very quickly things start to go wrong. Um, so I think what I really wanted to do was explore the dynamics of, of two characters without many other characters intervening. Um, so really kind of getting into um, into the relationship I guess uh, on one level it kind of works as a domestic thriller so kind of thinking about those um those dynamics and the horrors that can happen within your own home just between two people um but also there are these kind of um supernatural elements that seem to be interfering um and I I've always kind of liked psychological thrillers as well being a psychologist um <laughs> so so thinking about um I love that uncertainty where you don't know if something is real or if it's just in the character's mind. Um, so I kind of wanted to play up that as well. Um, so without giving too much away about the plot, that's that's kind of what the story is. No, that's really good. And it's and it's a 
it's good not to give up too much details of the plot because it's a really intricate one. So, but thank you for that summary. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the the self publishing process. I mean, how, how did it compare to the traditional route? I mean, what kind of what what were the mechanics that you went through to to get to get the novella published? Yeah, that that's a really good question. So. Um... I think again, having a book that you think is polished and it's it's ready to go. Um, I've still since self-publishing, since the version I first published, I found a couple of errors and had to revise. So that's um something that I'm still kind of getting better at. Um, and bearing in mind that when you're traditionally publishing, you will have a team of people who are combing through it, trying to um pick out all those errors. So you really need to make sure that you're doing that to the best of your ability. Um, it helps to have a good cover. So there are a few options there. You can create your own cover. So for Stella Polaris, I've created my own, which um, was a horrible experience. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> um, but you, you can do that, which saves some money. Um, you can commission someone to create a cover for you, which if you have a really strong idea in mind of what you want, then that's a really good thing to do. Um, but for mine, I went through a pre-made cover, which tend to be a little bit cheaper. Um, you don't have as much control over what you want, but you can find. Um, so I think I got mine from a website called Book Cover Zone, mm. where um, they they kind of have lots of covers that are um, up for sale. There's only one cover per author. So once you've purchased it, no one else is going to have the same cover as you, although some other covers might be similar and use similar imagery. Um, and you can, before you buy it, you can put your your name and your um, the title of your book in there to get a sense of what it looks like and if it's going to work. Um, and then you can pay for that. And I think mine was about £100. There are some out there that are cheaper. There are some that are a lot more expensive, but that's the kind of costs Um that it's going to to be then other things you need to think through are getting an isbn number and um and a barcode so some places like amazon will offer them for free so if you are wanting to just get your out work out there on a bit of a budget and your main priority is just having people read it you can do that for free I purchased mine through Nielsen so I um own my ISBN which is um kind of gives me a bit more control and confidence um, of that I kind of completely own that work. Um, and then and then just kind of trying to set up your book professionally. So thinking about um, making sure it's um, the spacing is correct, making sure you know what size you want your book to be. And there are lots of different actual platforms where you can upload it and get your ebook or your physical book copy. So I decided to do two different platforms. So I did um, Amazon um, Kindle Direct pu Publishing, and that was to get it onto Kindle the easiest way. I get a lot more um, money from <laughs> the Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing than any of my other um, sales. So they um, made my ebook and also a paperback that sold exclusively through Amazon. Um, but booksellers don't tend to make much money from Amazon because the, the prices aren't good for their wholesale. So if you want to get it into bookshops, um, it's really good to have another option. So there are lots out there and Googling will give you a kind of good overview. <laughs> But I went through Ingram Spark, um, so I had to pay quite a cheap fee to put it on there. And then um, I listed it with gardeners, which means that all the big booksellers, so Waterstones, Barnes and Noble, Blackwells, um, and lots of kind of online bookshops as well, have access to my book and they can sell it. Excellent. That was a really comprehensive reply and lots of really <laughs> useful information there. I hope some of my MA publishing students watch this back and uh, get some advice from you. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Stella Polaris and you mentioned the cover and um, how it links to your open swimming. So I was quite interested about this relationship between the writing and the swimming. And at one point in your presentation, you said that you very quickly became obsessed with um open water swimming so i wonder if you could touch on that a little bit um how how do you see that connection working is is there a deep rooted connection between the two um i'm not sure how much of a deep rooted connection there is other than the fact that i'm obsessed with both writing and swimming. <laughs> so i think as a writer it it really helps to be really really into something and to kind of deep dive i think i have a bit of an obsessive personality anyway so 
that's um, quite easy for me. But I also think um, perhaps the type of things that I like writing about. So um, quite a lot of my work is quite nostalgic and um, I really like writing about nature and the, the kind of interplay between characters and nature. So I think that writing about water and swimming um, works really well for that. Um, yeah, and, and I think also the other thing I would say is that it's great to write um, from experiences the, that you've had. So for me, a lot of my work is writing about swimming because my main adventures in life have been swimming orientated orientated ones so um I think that's probably why there's such a strong connection there yeah that's cool I mean there's a lot of things going on in your life I mean th that came across from your presentation very clearly I mean how do you balance being an author alongside all these other studies and jobs and other commitments that you have what time management tips would you perhaps give to creative writing students watching this video yeah um I I think I would probably give them very bad advice <laughs> with a grain of salt I think I know of other writers who try to write um 200 words a day or 500 words a day every single day and they'll set aside a certain amount of time to write that doesn't work for me so my attitude tends to be when I feel really inspired and I'm really in the mood to write I put aside everything else and just let the writing take over um when it works and I'm not too busy, that's a brilliant um, approach to take because I can get a lot of words down on paper really quickly and the quality tends to be a little bit better than if I'm forcing myself to write every day. Um, but obviously with the realities of life um, and having a job and all the other things that are going on, um, sometimes that can be a little bit manic. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so... I'm really intrigued about the open swimming. Um, when I saw saw the the plan for the webinar and 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 read your bio, I was really intrigued about the open swimming. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about training for ice swimming. I mean, that looked really extreme. Um, I understand that that you've done some ice swimming for Team GB. Is that correct? Yeah. So I've um I've just joined Team GB this year. So I've got the um, World Championships coming up in January. Um, but I've done lots of kind of international competitions and national competitions before. Um, so ice swimming itself um, is sometimes swimming in ice, but it's kind of classified as swimming in water that's less than five degrees Celsius. So um, in terms of training, the best thing is to... Um, get in the water when it's nice and cold um there are lot there are lots of kind of safety things you need to think about so um not staying in too long making sure someone's with you um but for me i think i've always loved getting in cold water in the summer and i think it just kind of carried on from there so um as it gets colder i just carried on going swimming and the first um, winter swimming competition that I did was when I was at York St. John and it was in Germany. Um, and my mum actually booked it as a holiday and said, um, she told me, oh, I've booked a swimming holiday in Germany. Oh, by the way, it's in December <laughs> and um, the the lake is going to be completely frozen over. So um, <laughs> it just kind of developed from there. But um, I think the really great thing about ice swimming is... Um, there aren't many people who are into it, surprisingly, because it's great. Um, but that means that you can get to quite a good level without necessarily being that much of a skilled swimmer. So um, I love swimming and I always do lots of swimming, but I'm not the fastest person in the world. Um, I can't swim longer than anyone else can in the world. Um, but because there are so few people doing ice swimming, by being really enthusiastic about it and signing up for all the competitions, I kind of um, have managed to to get to quite a high level. So I think um, if you're enthusiastic and competitive, um, but not necessarily that much of a skilled swimmer, it's, it's the perfect thing to do. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, if you if if someone like me, for instance, wanted to get into open water swimming, not necessarily ice swimming, but open water swimming, um, what kind of advice or tips would you give me to before I started? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So um, lots of people want to start in the winter, um, and I definitely advise against that. Start when it's nice and sunny, or if you really want to start in the winter, maybe try and go to Spain or something. Um, and make sure that you um, have someone with you, particularly if you're new to it. Some swimmers say you should always have someone with you. I do go on my own um, lots in the summer and sometimes even in the winter. But definitely until you're completely confident in the water, um, any body of open water, whether it's a lake or the sea or a river, is going to be more dangerous than going into a swimming pool. So until you're really conf confident with that particular body of water, you don't want to be going on your own. So either take a friend with you, preferably one who can swim, um, or there are lots of outdoor swimming groups that you can sign up to. So lots of um local communities i think sometimes there'll be ones that you pay for um so the the closest place to me in nottingham is a lake where you buy membership um but quite often they're just a group of people who like to turn up on a saturday morning at the river and get in um so i would say definitely joining a social group like that is a good thing to do other than that um the key things are get in slowly, don't stay in too long and make sure you've got lots of warm layers and preferably some tea and cake to have afterwards. <laughs> tea and cake, good advice. Um, to finish off with, uh, Alan, I'd like to ask you some quick fire questions. Maybe not quick fire, you know, take as long <laughs> as you like. Um, about your experience as a student and maybe your experience of, of being an alumni as well. Um, so what, for instance, was your favourite memory of being at York St John? Oh, that's I think that's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't have a specific memory, but I think the things that come back to me are the social aspect. So um, going on nights out with my housemates, um, one of the creative writing events we did was walking around the city walls. Um, and that was lovely. And just lots of kind of going to lovely tea rooms and cafes um, and writing. I mean, was there a, a particular module or course or, or you know, that you felt was quite influential in developing your skills during your time at St. John's? Yeah. So in, in third year, I did a course um, which was, I can't even remember the name of it. So it was influential, despite me not remembering <laughs> its name. I think it was understanding developmental disorders or, or something like that. It was focusing on developmental disorders. Um and I think the reason I liked that so much was um, it was a third year module and it was the moment at which I realised that my thinking was less about uh, remembering facts and taking down notes and memorising them and more kind of going into critical thinking and understanding the connections between things. Um, and I think that moment when you realise that you've kind of really got to that level of, of degree level thinking and it was just lovely so yeah I think that's a moment that really sticks with me great um what was what's been the single best piece of advice that you've been given by someone on your career journey so far do you think um I think probably I'm going to go with some advice that my agent gave me um both when I met, so I met my agent for the first time um, when I was a teenager and um, and wrote a book, I think, younger than most people write books, which actually didn't end up going anywhere. Um, but he said to me then, when I said I'm deciding whether to do um, an English degree or a psychology degree, he said um, something along the lines of, think about what experience would be best for your writing, not necessarily which one is most about writing. Um, and later on, um, he also said to me, when I was trying to rewrite old things that I'd written years and years ago, he said, you're living all of these really great experiences, so you should focus on them and really appreciate how good they are. Um, and I think as someone who nearly did an English degree and was very tempted to, but ended up choosing a different path, I think for a while I've had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about not being an English student and not um, having that kind of study of literature that I wanted and, and about that affecting my writing. But I think there's something really valuable in appreciating the opportunities you have and all the really exciting things you're doing and letting them build your 
your character, your personality, your writing, if you are a writer, um, and letting that really kind of develop who you are and and consolidate your identity, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. I think that's really wonderful, wonderful advice, actually. Um, and I think those words are very relevant to a lot of people who are considering about being writers and, you know, creative writing degrees are fantastic. You know, I teach on them. I should say that. Uh, but yeah, but experiences, experiences of different varieties are, are the key to being a fantastic writer. I totally agree with that. Okay, one last question. Uh, what do you wish you could say to your younger self who is at your at university? Oh, um, be more confident um, and probably relax a little bit. I think <laughs> um, this might not be what you want your students to hear, but I think that um, <laughs> working really hard academically and getting the best grades isn't the be all and end all of everything. Um, it is a great thing to do, but um, also enjoy those other experiences and make sure that you you enjoy yourself when you're in the moment, because one day you'll be older like me looking back on those times and remembering how good they were. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a really great place to finish the conversation, actually, a really positive kind of final message. Um, Ellen, thank you so much for your time and for joining us on this webinar. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, I should say everyone should read Seth the Crow now. Go and find it, get a copy, read it. It's absolutely wonderful. And uh, once again, if you have any questions, uh, please do get in touch with the alumni office here at York St. John and they will pass those questions on. But uh, thank you very much, Ellen. One last time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Bye.